Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak about Monol100.ie as part of the Clare County Library History Week, part of the Decade of Centenaries programme. The Monol100.ie is part of an initiative by the Commemorations Unit, looking at the women's strand of the Decade of Commemorations. Um, it has been, has been part of the, uh, the programme uh, since the beginning of the Decade of Centenaries, but um, this year, the, the focus is now on having a designated site. And so Manol 100 is a sort of one-stop shop to look at various uh, um, initiatives focusing on what we're describing as, as centenary moments. Because while we look at the canon of Irish history about events that happened, it has been, of course, as one would understand, very male dominated. And so what we're looking at is events that involved women. And so um, there's a huge variety of, of, of material that's on the site. And we've worked with partners in the National Culture Institutions. We're working with the Decade of Centenaries coordinators across the local authorities network. So we were reflecting um, those, those relationships and those partnerships in the selection of the material that we have. We're also very grateful to a huge number of the uh, descendants of the women who were activists who have provided us with material from their private collections. So we're going to give you a flavor um, today as part of this, 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 this talk of what has um, been on the site previously and some of the as maybe a little bit of what you can see there. So um, I'm very grateful to my colleagues in the commemorations unit, to Kate Nevin and also to Maeve Hickey for um, um, producing this uh, PowerPoint uh, reflective of the work that we've done as the Manoa 100 team. Thank you. So Manoa 100 is a century of change. As we all know that over the past 100 years and uh, since the foundation of the state, the role of women has been, um, a, you know, a been in history. We've had, a, had women in politics, but a very, very small percentage of women that got to the cabinet table um, over that period of time. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about the work that we've done on that uh, timeline as part of the Decade of Centenaries programme. Also, and during the century of change, it's been a really difficult time for women. And I know that during History Week, that, that a number of the talks will focus on some of that more difficult history and looking at things like the mother and baby homes as part of what's been looked at this week. So our, our contribution here from the um, Department of, of Tourism, Culture, Arts, Gale Tuck Sports and the Media is to look at women's involved in the, in the centenary. And, uh, and obviously our minister, uh, Minister Martin, has had an involvement herself in the promotion of women in politics, having set up the caucus when she uh, entered politics and entered the House of the Oireachtas. So uh, um, we, I'll continue on now and just talk about that 100 year journey, which culminates in that very end in 2018 when women got the vote. And so brings it up really up to the present time. But that 100 year journey is broken down into two decades. And I'm going to look at, at some of the sort of the pieces from that decade uh, um, during this talk today. So the idea here is that it's, it's a resource for the classroom so that it could be done in small segments and small sound bites that if someone comes to the website, they may enter the website through this timeline and then find themselves in this other place. And so the idea is that, that it, the medium in which we have been delivering the material, so whether it's films or podcasts or, you know, galleries of images or articles, the idea is, is that it's general history. It's not, it's not meant to be academic. It's not supposed to be dense. It, you, if you come to Irish history for the first time, you can take it in in these small stories, but then it's part of a larger picture. So the idea of the, the century timeline is what we would have looked at as, as historians when I was studying history. Um, a number of decades ago, and that was the, in that ensuring that you understand the context of where this, this story comes from. So I start here with an image that comes from the National Library of Ireland, who have done an incredible amount of digitization, which has been constantly updated. So there's an incredible wealth of material available for students, but also for family members, people who are researching family history. And this is an image of Kate O'Callaghan and Mary McSweeney entering into what is now the National Concert Hall, where they are attending uh, Dáil Éireann. Um, I, but this is in 1922, because 
when the split happened in January of 22, there was an election then that later that year where these two women were elected. But we don't have um, the numbers uh, that we had previously. There were six and now they were down to two members. And then for a period of time afterwards, women's involvement becomes less and less. And, um, you know, and it isn't again until quite late on in the in in the uh, in the 1950s that we get the numbers that we had in the 20s. And so what we've done in, on the website is we have a virtual tour of an exhibition that we did where this information comes from. And again, this is broken down into the dial of each of the, the decades so that if you were studying something on the 20s, you could just do the 20s or you could jump forward if you were interested in the 70s. And one of the things that we talked about with families when they came to the exhibition, which is actually um, without the objects, it's down in the main guard in Clonmel um, during the season. So the OPW site there in the center of Clonmel and the way that the, the, it's structured is you said if you were to go to the part of the exhibition that is the date of your own birth and it's very interesting then to be able to describe where you are in relation to your other family members so we found that if if a grandmother came with her granddaughter how far rem removed are they from the panel of the date of their their, their births it sort of gives you some sense of of how how difficult difficult generations think and how influenced you are by your own time timeline and your own time in in history and so it was really important to tell that story so we're moving on now into the 1930s this is a, a flyer again from the national Li um, library's collection and it's it's manana public that which was a splinter group from common Amman. And um, what's interesting about the Slender Group is that it actually directly relates to Mary McSweeney because they, those who supported the second Doyle Aaron um, and continued on after the split meeting as the All-Ireland Doyle was led at one point and called the Miss McSweeney's Doyle. Now, while the story of, of, of women in politics is a story about a layered and, and complex story around many, many organizations where women remained politicized, the, the idea of this of this timeline is just to give you a taster and a feel for that time. We have looked at ordinary people. I mean, the people that wouldn't maybe make it to your history books, but they were they are reflective of the representing their era and their time frame. And this is um, a travel permit that many of you may actually have if you had family members that traveled um, back and forth through the United Kingdom during the period of what we knew in Ireland as the emergency. And the period then allowed for the, um, uh, um, uh, because of the wartime situation, a permit to be issued because we've always had a common travel area. And of course, we don't have to show any paperwork when we pass within what's known as the geography as the British Isles. And so this is the only time in which we get a snapshot of an understanding of how many people were there, um, you, know, you know, going back and forth to England. And of course, so many people worked as nurses at this time. And, and this is, um, you know, the story of, of, of a permit and, 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 and out of a young woman. And we're very grateful to the, the Glennon family for, for providing this um, material for us. Then we move into the 1950s and the whole um, focus in the 1950s was trying to, and no more than today, is a focus on, 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 on universal health care. And then there was a whole controversy that, that came about because of this particular document. And it actually was um, an advanced publication that was distributed talking about a proposed uh, health system that was being proposed by Dr. Noel Brown, um, uh, who was from Clan La Publica. And the idea being that this was to uh, make uh, mother and baby um, um, medicine available to everyone. And it was opposed. Now, a version of it later came uh, about and, and was brought in. But this, this, this famous mother and child scheme was abandoned because of opposition from within the medical profession and also from, from the Catholic Church. And um, we've also looked throughout the, 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 the timeline and also into the, um, the films that we have with, as part of that exhibition, which you can see on the virtual tour, is looking at women in sport, 
uh, women in, in science or medicine and, and just really touched on women who became first in their professions. And of course, now there's quite a lot of material that, you know, about the, the involvement in women in sport and the importance of, of, of women in the Camogie movement. And we're very grateful to the Camogie for, um, organization for providing this picture. And so the, um, while this, ex the, this particular talk is not really about, and I'm, I'm very conscious I'm not naming names because I'm also conscious that I don't want to be drawn in to telling you those stories because we'll be here for much longer than my time slot. So that's why I'm moving along, just talking about the nature of the site. So obviously encouraging you to go online, to look at it and, and, and to, to, um, to read um, the stories there. So this is a, a document called uh, Women Chains or Change. So that's the cover of it. And then that's the central page. And this is part of Nuala Fennell's collection. And Nuala Fennell, of course, was, was hugely important in, in, in promoting um, women's rights and, um, and was involved in organizations like AIM, setting up the first uh, shelter for women who were um, victims of domestic violence. Um, and so what's really interesting about this document that was was actually publicized on the Late Late Show was that when you hear about it, it's a central document. It's one of the key documents of women's history over the century. And it was put together and, and stapled together and it was sold at, at, at churchyards. And it, it was one of the, the, the documents that drew so many women in to political life. And there was a very important election in 1977 when they, uh, there was the greatest number of women candidates. And so we have that sort of leapfrog from the, the 20s to the 70s in terms of the engagement in women in politics. And so we talk about the waves of feminism and, and the 1970s was, was important in Ireland as American literature came to the fore. And again, if you want to look at the sort of type of items and the, the type of context that we had for this particular document, I would encourage you to look at the virtual tour and look at the 1970s. And so what happened with the with the exhibition that we have, this is from the wonderful collection of, of, of Alan Kinsella, who's been collecting um, uh, lection literature and memorabilia since he was in his in his teens. So he uh, right back to the 1980s. And and this is the sort of, you know, ephemera disposable material that gets gets discarded becomes essential then when you're putting together historical uh, work or, or, or the types of things that we're doing on Mano 100. We're looking for this type of, of, of material to sort of symbolize and, 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 and explain various events that happened in history. And if you're interested in literature and posters and all that ephemera, you'll often have come across the Irish election literature um, dot org site, which is Alan's site, and that's where he actually publicizes his his collection, and he brings it to various uh, party um, party um, conferences and uh, and and sets up his pop-up uh, exhibitions of this material. Um, and some cases he has the only copies of these leaflets because what happens in terms of pol politics and saving this material is it doesn't necessarily find its way into an archive. There were moves to collect all the election literature um, produced or at least you know, to try and, and, and capture some of it. But, but when a, a candidate may lose the election, they don't keep any of the material. And when they win, they have no need to keep their election. So it's, it, it's, a, it's a very interesting look at how things get forgotten or how we don't actually have the documentation that we need in the modern times and uh, that how material gets lost and, and discarded. So I'm moving on, of course, to the 1990s, where the where the um, the the uh, election of Mary Robinson um, happened, and of course it was this this moment where she, you know, talked about you know the Manona Heron, and she entered into a, a new era where there was accessibility within the within um, Orson Uthron, and it was a, a really important moment for women. But but Mary Robinson features in the exhibition right back to the 1960s where she's a senator. And we had this really, really poignant moment when we were putting together the exhibition for the centenary of the election of the first woman. And because it was divided in Dublin Castle between two rooms, which you'll see online. And what happened was 1969 was the cutoff of one room into the other room. And then you have a hundred years because um, Countess uh, Demarkovich was born in 1868. 
And, you know, 100 years from her birth to that moment and the 1969 then becomes the, the, the you know, the, the 50th anniversary of the of the first Doyle. And she's the only woman elected. You have to get into the 1970s and in the case of Dublin Castle into the other room to be in the 1970s to have, a, you know, to have more Gagan Quinn as our second cabinet minister. But when you when you look at the, the story for Mary Robinson, you think about people alive. She's one of the few people that is still alive from the first room. So it's very much a history. It's in our past. And then moving forward, the separation back into the 1970s and onwards. So one of the other things that we looked at as a major part of the, uh, the, the website to date was we looked at the Toward America piece. It was really important for the team when we were putting together the concept for the, the website that we would look at the internationalism of the um, how women you know impacted for Ireland abroad, how women from abroad impacted the, what happened in Ireland, and also looking at the numbers of people who were what we would describe as as non-combatants, people who weren't involved in the events of these these turbulent years. So they were living through the First World War. They lived through the through the the campaign of independence, which was from the rising through to the to what we now know as the war of independence into the civil war but they weren't actively involved so they weren't members of organizations like like um the the, the irish volunteers or the irish republican army or in common amon or common assyria or the fianna Erin or the the girl scouts there was um Glana Gale Girl Scouts, they, they weren't members of those organizations. They were what would be known as sympathizers or innocent victims caught up in the reprisals of the back and hands, you know, where, where, he, where whole towns were, you know, were, were shot up or burnt or there was destruction happening. And the importance of, the, of those people being part of the historical record is in an organization known as the White Cross. So what we did was we looked at the, how, the, how women who were in politics in America lent their names and their profiles to bringing attention to what was termed conditions in Ireland, because this was a war that was, was being undertaken as part of the Dominion. It was a domestic problem for the British. It was being administered by the police. And many of you who are tuning in will be very familiar with what was the circumstances. But the but the but this con con this committee that was put together in America, this is new research. This is a new take on this, and we're hoping that with the work that we're doing by putting a small film together called Toward America, that people will look at this and they'll find subject matter for their special topics. That American students might but might be aware to look at material in America and then marry the work the material that they have in America with the material that we have in Ireland. So it's, it's really a reaching out as such, and it's been made possible by having this wonderful resource. So Jane Adams, who was leading up the international women's peace movement that was based in Geneva, she too gave her status. She was a social worker, she was a writer, she was an educationalist. I mean, she was involved in, you know, so many important organizations, whether it would be to do with child labor, whether it was to do with access to politics. I mean, she was a powerhouse of her of her time. And she there, central in this photograph, again, coming from the National Library sec section, married with her piece from the Library of Congress, her photograph from there, and that she's standing in the middle of these men. These were the commissioners who undertook in Washington, D.C. in 1920 to organize a series of interactions with the people who had been affected. Some of them couldn't come over and accept the invitation because it was a wartime situation. They couldn't get passport ports to get there. They did try also to engage with the unionists and, and, and have the British perspective and make it um, a commission and an investigation, but it did end up being mostly an Irish investigation, but they produced reports and they produced material that then could be distributed to international journalists documenting the Irish uh, story, the Irish struggle. And what's really important here is, is that it was instrumental in bringing about the, um, the negotiation for the Articles Agreement between the, the Great Britain and Ireland, the negotiation that led to a treaty that led in turn to the establishment of the Irish Free State. And then subject, so, oh, she also, Jane Adams, 
in, became involved in the organization which was separate, which was the Committee for Relief in Ireland, which was the fundraising arm that involved a lot of Irish Americans um, across the whole of the United States. And they raised $5 million, an incredible amount of money at this time. Can you imagine in terms of, of, of you know, there were so many people in need, so many countries in need post the, the, the war with all of the, the descendants of those, those people in America fundraising, sending food parcels. And then the Irish raised this amazing amount of money of $5 million. And so the, so the story then ends up being about the White Cross and what happened there. So these are photographs um, that came um, thank to, to the, the, the Brewer McSweeney family for giving this photograph of Muriel in America using the telephone, which she used to call her, her small daughter, Moira, um, back in, back in, that was a, a memory that she had of that time. And then the photograph of, of Muriel and her, and her sister-in-law, Mary, giving testimony in the Lafayette Hotel in Washington. And then these are later protests. One that we have Muriel McSweeney, uh, which is, which is an, an event that's coming up. She went back to America later on, and, and again is involved in protests in the in the later period when you know after the truce and into the Republican period and then American women here protesting at a later at an earlier stage with the American flag being held by the policeman a wonderful image and you can see the the wealth and status of this particular woman you know very well dressed in her high heels and furs and so all the White Cross had its its involvement in, in America, there was a group of nurses who were making themselves available to come over. We've no further information on that. And the reason that we include these images also in these power presentations is you may know of somebody who, who was in the 1920s a, a White Cross nurse, then that may lead to a, to a documentation or an archive. And, and it's really important to see. So the, the, the papers that you see here are, are coming from Helen Litton. They were actually Kathleen Clark's own books and records that she had in her possession that have passed down through descent to Helen Litton, who would be her grand niece. So it's really important, the idea of these inserts to document the story of what happens for women. And then we were very fortunate to get photographs from the, um, Erskine Childers' uh, uh, um, grandson, who was also Erskine Childers the third, and he present he he he, he uh, allowed us access and having the photograph of um, Molly Childers here on her wedding day, a fabulous image of her, and then of course the famous photograph of her with Mary Spring Rice in the and the in the host gun running that you'll be very familiar with. This is Kilmainham Jail's um, copy of that particular image. So we, we move on now to another part of the uh, of the the offering that's on the Manoa 100 site, and then you'll see the curfew murders. And this is a postcard for Limerick, um, and the curfew murders were the night in which two Lord Mayors, the former Lord Mayor and um, Michael O'Callaghan, and the and the and the and the sitting Lord Mayor George Clancy were killed on the same night on um, in the centre of Limerick in their homes in front of their wives. And it's the testimony of their wives that makes this so vivid and so important. And um, we, you can listen to that online in the, on the Manoa 100 site. And it's so important that we have this particular um, story there. Um, it's also told um, in relation to, the, to a, a, a photo essay that's been produced by Limerick by, by, um, by Dr. Sean Gannon. And he tells the story of the curfew murders. And then we include the story of the women, but taking readings from their firsthand accounts and so we have them read by two uh, great uh, women uh, who represent not only those women in terms of, uh, um, they're also representing their, their localities. So Dawn Bradfield is actually from the area in, uh, in Cork where um, Kate O'Callaghan was brought up, uh, Lisa Varda, um, and it's really important for us that she has that Cork accent as she's reading the, uh, the, the account but it's, it's interesting, she's lived away from Cork for many years, so, and so did Kate O'Callaghan. So although Limerick claim her, she of course is a Cork woman. And then we have M.O. Kelly, who comes from the very area of the, the north of the city in Limerick, where, where um, and Mary Clancy 
uh, was living and remained living for the rest of her life. And she actually grew up in the very neighborhood where Mary Clancy had lived. And so she does a beautiful reading. Of course, you'll know Emma Kelly as RTE's education correspondent. Of course, uh, Dawn Bradfield is, a, is an actress with a string of um, successes behind her. Um, and then we talked. We we, we were talking um, about uh, earlier on about how the, uh, the the decade of centenaries coordinators are in the local authorities, and then in many of the local authorities, they also have a historian in residence program. And we've worked really closely with those historians in residence, and many of them are, you know, you know, early career historians, and 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 you know, their work has been absolutely phenomenal during this period real primary research you know in really invested in, and knowledgeable in their own local communities and they know the terrain the great thing is the local historian can unlock so many interconnections and family links and all of that and we've seen that very clearly and this is a map of Westmead and on the green dots that you can see on the map they're the localities in which the women that have been selected represent and these are women that not only contributed and during the campaign of independence in their own home place, but also were contributing both abroad and, uh, and, and, and nationally. So we have this wonderful mix of local, national, and international, which we try and bring out throughout the site. Um, and so this is a wonderful photograph. It's a very interesting photograph. And there's like, I could, I could literally talk about it, but I urge you to, you know, to go online and, and look at the work of Paul Hughes. And we're waiting for a book that he's writing on the Janelles, where they'll really examine the story here. And he was responsible. This is in Mullingar Library, but he can tell the story not only of Janelle himself, Lawrence Janelle, but also of his brother, James Janelle, who had a huge and um, sort of impact abroad and so i'm only giving you a taster here and as i said in terms of what what's going on so we have concluded the the photograph but it's an interesting one it's like um you know it's 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 believed to be their wedding photograph or the day of their wedding it was his, it was his second marriage but the idea of having sort of you know the the the, the 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 groom and the bride and the best man in the sort of formal picture it you know perhaps suggests that this is just one of a set but it, it was wonderful to have this image and a lot of the images of uh, of Alice, she she uh, she doesn't engage with the camera at all, and and uh, so it's wonderful to have an image of her here. And then this is um, uh, Seamus and Kitty O'Doherty, who also made an impact in America, and uh, the uh, their their son wrote a book, um, my rebel, my parents and and other rebels, and and again you can get it through your local library, and we've used that for um, the material that's here and Paul um, used it on the Westmead site and then we're using it on our own website. So um, I, again, I urge you to go on the, on the Westmead Decade of Centenaries blog to get their full story. And then we have Eileen McCarville and we're very fortunate to have that. And her granddaughter has given us a lovely piece of, 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 an, of an interview um, where she talks about her own research and her own discovery and her own finds on her grandmother. And uh, she does a wonderful presentation and she's sitting in front of a portrait of her grandmother. So, you know, we're in her, you know, you know, front room, we're getting that access that we so rarely get. I mean, we've sort of, you know, it's become something of the, this period in time where you're even seeing me now in, in my own home. But it, it, it's the importance here is, is that this is very rare that we would have had that access. And that's something and a great dimension of the decade of centenaries. And so we've also done a podcast series and uh, we, we have done two at this stage. And the second episode is called Touchstone. And the uh, idea of Touchstone is, is to look at the Markovich Bursary Award winners. These are our artists through various disciplines who have actually um, won an award year on year to have time and space to think, to develop their practice. And that's the, the award, the money that they're given. So they have to, in the spirit of, of Markovich is, is to actually get time to explore their creativity. And so we um, have a very interesting group of women, all, as I said, leaders in their fields who represent each of the years. So Barbara Bergen was awarded it in 2021. Anne-Marie was given the award along with the collective sworn states um, in the first year um, and they and Joanne Walsh 
um, was 2020. So it's, it's very important that this Markovich Bursary Awards remembers the, the, the story of Markovich herself. And, you know, the, 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 the listening to this, this particular podcast is not just about the story of, 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 you know, the past or Markovich or people in the past. It's also bringing it right up to the present. And that was really important to us in on all100.ie. It was also to bridge that 100 years to sort of see where our influences are. So the idea of a touchstone is, is that how much was Markovich a touchstone? Maybe not in terms of her artist, artistry, but we, we want that to highlight the fact that she was working in various mediums and she was a creative person. So, but at the same time is, is are they inspired as her as a, as a political person, as the first woman elected, as a first, you know, like in terms of it, she's one of the first cabinet ministers in Europe when you think of it. Um, but uh, uh, again, this, uh, this lecture is just literally to give you a flavor and a taste and we urge you to just to go in and explore this for yourself. And so here, this is this wonderful uh, photograph that comes from the collection at Lissadell um, House. And Lissadell's collection was given to us as part of the uh, offering that's on Manol100.ie. And we're very fortunate and very grateful to them for their support of us in, in, in this particular um, project, because these photographs sort of give you a completely different look at Markovich. I mean, it's this idea that her life is so documented. I mean, she was so well known uh, in her time that you know so much of her life can be actually illustrated, whether it be photographs, paintings that she did, or material that she owned, you know, the letters that she wrote. So she's one of the few women. We talk about women who have an archive or women who have a, a memory. I mean, she is there as one of the people that everybody knows. And so to be able to do something new or do something that's sort of unexpected is one of the joys of working in the um, Manol100.ie um, project. And I think my colleagues share that, um, you know, sort of feeling about it as well, that we are doing something new and something worthwhile. And so these are some of the, the, the artworks of Markovich. And, and again, these are from uh, Lissadell's collection and they won't have been you know, widely shared before. And so you can see that she was uh, a woman of considerable talent and, and this, the, the, the works on, or the, the, the life drawings are from her time when she was at the Academy Julien in Paris. And then you have um, the image on the other side, which is a, a worker when she was um, married and they spent their honeymoon in, uh, even though um, Markovich was, um, Casimir Dunin de Markovich was, a, was a, a, a Polish nobility, the area in which, which their, their lands were at the time of their marriage was, was part of um, what is present day Ukraine. So and uh, that's uh, um, where the where the painting was, was was produced, and this is a huge, you know, immense canvas that actually dominates the whole wall, back wall at the gallery area of the um, the, the the Catholic Church in Kilmainham Jail. So again, you may be familiar with it from seeing it there, but the um, this particular illustration doesn't really um, give you the sense of its magnitude or its impact. And again, it it shows. Um, Markovich's, you know, a sort of ability, and she was selling really, really well, and, and she was making her way as an artist at this time, but then when her husband and uh, herself moved permanently back to Ireland uh, in 1901, they set up a, a theatre company, they established the United Arts Clubs, so they, so they were doing many other things, and, and then when she was 40 in 1908, she became politicised, and it's really important to remember when you think about Markovich is that it really is a very, very short political life, and um, you know that she had I mean she she was dead in in you know in 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 her 50s you know 59 so um she did she achieved a lot and possibly her her political life led to her early death because she had at least I think it's five five um different sets of imprisonments but we're really talking in this podcast about her her uh, her acting and so these are two stills from from uh, again National Library collection of her um involved in 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 you know um different um, uh, you know, stage um, stage productions. And what was really important is that they, while they were in minor theatres, she also was on the Abbey stage, which is a nice sort of dimension that it still exists today as our national theatre. And so there's, you know, scattered across, you know, these collections, and these are from the Abbey's archive itself, is, 
is the, you know, are the playbills. And again, this ephemera that survives that shows her. And in, and uh, and this one she's using is sort of a, 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 you know, a stage name and it's Constance uh, Gore, but that's her. And, uh, and uh, you know, so again, it, it's great to have this material uh, reproduced. And then this is to represent the fact that she was a poet again from Lissadov's collection and then you know as we go into the political period now going forward you know she starts to do a lot of propaganda and we'll be looking at that later on and um, during this year and the year to come about you know the her, again back to her as a as a political leader and how she was using her skills to 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 um promote um the cause and so um and then this is the um Joseph Croft's um, you know, um, put music to her battle hymn, and it was her. Uh, she wrote it for the Irish Citizen Army. So again, this the idea of her being a lyricist and and working in this way with music, um, just gives you another flavour of the types of work that she did. And then I just wanted to end really to talk about one of the seminars that we did. We did a number of seminars. We've uh, we've had historians, we've had family members, we've. It's been very interesting. We've done work with the NYU um, and, and uh, Dr. Miriam Nyland um, has been very supportive of the work that we've been doing in, in Mano100.ie. Um, she's originally from a uh, mixture of Cork and Cork, Wicklow, Cork, Cork and Wicklow, I think Cork family and, and, and lived in, in Wicklow, um, but she's now um, in New York City. And so um, we also got involved with an organization called the International Association of Women's Museums. Um, I'm a I'm a member, and I've now um, just recently been appointed to the board, and so that's a, uh, it's very uh, important to me, and it's work that I'm really interested in. It's just talking about what what women are doing across the world, and particularly with this with with Manol100.ie having an online presence, it's really important that we generate that international dimension to the work that we're doing in Ireland, because I think we can be really proud of what we've done over the last number of years, both in governance and in general, at, with, with uh, universities and, and, and younger women and young, early career historians. So I suppose when we're talking about the, you know, what would you put in a women's museum, past, present and future, we were asking really about what was happening abroad. What were they doing with their, their stories? And we did find that you know, they're dealing with difficult issues. I mean, the, the, the issues that Irish women have experienced have been experienced across the world. And so a lot of the museums are about, you know, human rights, social justice, you know, talking about women's experience in war. But one of the things that we found through this conference, which you can listen to online, was that the that, that people were, were trying to depict women not in, in, in victimhood, but to try and to understand the role of women within in communities and going forward and so so the, these are a really impressive group of women that come across from norway germany uh, uh costa rica uh south korea and uh darling clover who who's who's in canada so it's a quite a wide wide ranging discussion and what we discovered when we were doing it of course it's all about contemporary politics because you know darling refers to the you know the 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 burials of the indigenous um, peoples and that was just in the press at the time and of course that you know throws up a, you know a, you know issues around the the, the um the you know the way in which we display material the way in which we write about material the people that we represent and how representative of are we and so um what i what we also are looking at in in the the international association that comes out here is is obviously diversity and inclusion in relation to the offering that we have and so here we have this wonderful, you know, quilt. We asked the, the, the women in their presentation to take objects that reflected the type of work that they did. And, and in Germany, they, one woman, one world, um, it, you know, it looks out of Germany and at the, 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 the work of women across the world and, and a lot about handicraft and a lot about how they may, you know, how they, how, how, what people do to, to you know, to, to express. So, it's, so there's a lovely mix between historical collections and art historical collections and contemporary work and, the, and, and, and objects of the past. But we thought that this was a lovely image to actually show, um, you know, a, a woman's day. And 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 again, when you look at this this quilt, you you can all already identify. So it breaks down the barriers between various uh, different cultures as well, because we all live quite a similar life. Obviously, um, some people in different parts of the world have, you know, obviously have have difficult uh, lives in terms of in terms of the modern conveniences. But again, it just symbolizes just one day in a life of a woman uh, living in, in our own lifetime. And then the um, 
then Mona had this image of a of a washerboard, and the reason that it was there was because it was donated. And um, this particular woman uh, kept kept doing her washing in the traditional way, and when she died. Her family members gave it to a museum because it wasn't most people had gotten rid of it and their their family member had kept doing it. And then when they researched the woman, she had been really uh, um, important in the town. She'd been involved in in politics her whole life and she'd been a serving member um, in their assembly. But the object was donated because of her traditional role. So uh, that's the end of the uh, the piece on Manoa 100. I hope that it has uh, um, made you keen to actually look at the, the website itself. And we welcome anyone to come and comment to us directly. And you can uh, reach us at, at commemorations at T-C-A-G-S-M. So that's Tourism, Culture, Arts, Gaeltacht, Sports and Media. .ie. Oh, sorry, go, go .gov .ie. So that's uh, so uh, commemorations at t c a g s m .gov .ie. Thank you very much again, and thank you so much to Dolores um, for the opportunity to speak at uh, uh, Clare County History Week. Thank you.